Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss the rights and duties of shareholders. Who are the shareholders? Shareholders are also known as the stockholders, the people that own the stocks of the company. And those are the owners of the company. As, as owners of the company, you have several key rights, duties, and obligation and forms of authority you need, you need to be aware of as a shareholder and you need to be aware of these rights, duties, and obligation for the CPA exam. So as a shareholder, you're on the top of the hierarchy in a company. Literally, you own the company. You own the company, you're mean on the top. But what rights and duties do you have as part, as part owner? This is what we will discuss in this session. The first right we are going to discuss, and this is basically the most powerful in my opinion, is your voting right. You can vote. You can make crucial decision for the corporation through your voting rights. And these usually voting rights include two aspects. One is when you select the board of directors. Shareholders typically vote annually to elect or remove members of the company's board of directors. So since you're on the top, right below you should be the board of directors. But who select those board of directors? You, the shareholders, select the board of directors. And in turn, the board of directors, they can select the committee to run the company. They can appoint the CEO who, run, who hires VPs, who hires top-level managers, who hires lower-level man, lower level management, who they hire employees. They run the company on your behalf as a shareholder. The other aspect of voting is you can vote on fundamental changes on major corporate changes such as, such as dissolving the company. And we will have a separate recording on those major fundamental changes, but those are your two voting power. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course, such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses, broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Now, the mechanism for voting, we need to be familiar with this. Usually, it's one vote, one stock, one vote. So the more stocks you have, you vote with your stocks. So if there are 10,000 shares outstanding and you own 1,000 shares, one vote, one stock, you have 10% saying in the company. This is the standard unless, this is the standard most of the time, unless the company's articles of incorporation, which we talked about articles in incorporation when we, formed the, when we formed the corporation, specify a different arrangement. So what's the different arrangement? You could have what's called the cumulative voting for directors. Again, the Articles of, of Incorporation may allow this when voting for directors. In this system, each share gets many, as many votes as there are director positions to fill. When we say directors, board of direct, bo boards of directors. Now, shareholders can distribute these votes in any manner, including putting all the votes in one candidate. And what, I'm going to show you an example to see how it works. And this method is beneficial for minority shareholders as it increases their chances of having representation on the board. So if, you, if, you, if you're a minority shareholder and there are four, five board of directors, you can vote for at least one of them and have five votes. If you have one share, if you have 100 shares, you'll have 500 votes. Let's take a look at an example. Let's assume we have five director positions available and we have a minority shareholder. What's minority? Minority, it means they don't have a lot of shares. They own 100 out of maybe 10,000. In a cumulative voting system, each share equal to five votes, one for each director. What does that mean? It means this, this individual shareholder, they can take those 100 shares times five, they have 500 votes. And a one vote equal to one share, they have 100 vote. Here they have 500 votes. Now can they, they can take this 500 votes and if they want to, they can devote them to one person, one board of director, increases their chances of being represented. So they can allocate all 500 votes to one candidate for influence. And the outcome is, what's the advantage of this? It enhances the chances of this particular person to be elected, although you want them, but you don't have the power. It's given you, it's given the minority shareholders the power to elect. That's what that's what the cumulative voting does. The other rights you have as a shareholder is the right to participate in dividend. Now, what's dividend? 
Dividend is when the company makes a profit, revenues minus expenses. After they pay all their expenses, we have profit or net income. Now the company will have two options. They can keep the profit, and we call this retained earnings when they keep the profit, or they can take the profit and pay it out as dividend. So part of it goes to shareholders. So it's distribution of dividend. Now, first thing you want to know is there is no automatic right for dividend. Simply put, because you own stocks and the company makes a profit, it doesn't mean you're going to get a dividend. The board of directors, the people that you elected, they will have to vote and declare that dividend. In other words, if they don't, you have no dividend. In other words, the company keeps the profit. Why do they keep the profit? To grow the company. The shareholders do not automatically have a right to distribution, like cash dividend or share repurchase. They are only available when they are declared by the board of directors. And once they, de once they are declared, because they have first they declared them, then they distribute them. Once a dividend is declared, it means the board of directors says, we are going to pay $1 per share, for example. That declaration create a liability for the company. They are considered, now the shareholders are considered unsecured creditors for the corporation to the extent of the dividend amount. So let's assume we have 100,000 shares and they declared $1 per share. Now we have a liability called dividend payable of $100,000. And all the shareholders that have claim to this, they become unsecured creditors in case of bankruptcy. Well, that doesn't usually happen unless you're Enron. When the company declares dividend, it means they are making a profit and they have the cash for it. And every once in a while, the company declares dividend and they declare bankruptcy. An example is Enron, but that's unusual. That you declare dividend, you think everything is going good, and a month later, you went bankrupt. <laughs> it's unusual unless you're Enron. So when the company declares dividend, remember the dividend comes out of retained earning. Well, here I said, you know, I said, let's assume the company made $100,000 in revenue, uh, $30,000 in expenses, they have profit of 70. Well, I said, you can distribute it or you can keep it. Technically, technically, first you keep it, then the dividend comes out of retained earnings. So after you keep it, so after you keep it, the dividend comes out of retained earnings. It's the same thing as, you know, maybe you want to distribute 20 and keep 50. So of this, you know, if you want to keep 50, you have 70 in total, then you take out 20, then you keep 50. But usually it's it, it's out of retained earning. Any distribution to shareholder reduce the corporate shareholder's equity because, because the dividend comes out of retained earning. First, first you put you put it in in uh, in retained earnings, then you take it out. Now we have to be familiar with something called preferred shareholders. Now, if you're an accounting student and taking, you know, you're taking your CPA exam, you need to know what preferred shareholders. Preferred shareholders are another class of shareholders. When we don't mention anything, we assume that the shareholders are common shareholders. Well, if they're not common, if they are preferred, the preferred have certain preferences. The first thing that they do to preferences is the preferences in terms of dividend. They get their dividend first. So, not all shareholders are necessarily equal in the right to receive distribution. A corporation can create a different class of shares, each with its own sets of rights, like preferred shares. Now, within common stocks, within common stocks, just want to let you know, we could have class A, we could have class B, we could have class C, where class A can vote, B and C cannot vote. They're not true owners, so on and so forth. But we don't get into that much details. Just know that we have a preferred shareholders. Now, the preferred shareholders... They are preferred in terms of what? When we pay dividend, you remember that company that generated 100,000 in revenues, uh, 30,000 in expenses, and let's keep this real, and they have net income or profit of 70. This profit goes to retained earnings. Then from retained earnings, as I mentioned, it's gonna we're, we're gonna pay out the dividend. Now, if we have a preferred shareholders, first, we pay those preferred shareholders. So the preferred shares, often come with a priority over common shares. So if we're distributing 20,000, well, first we have to pay the preferred. Let's assume the preferred gets all the 20,000, what's left for the common zero. Or let's assume the preferred gets five and what's left is goes to the common. So the common are paid last. This means the, share, the preferred, they are entitled to receive the dividend before common shareholders. And we have many types of preferred dividend. Because preferred dividend is a form of a contract. Now, bear in mind, the preferred dividend, they do tell you how much dividend you're going to be receiving. It's usually a dollar amount, like $1 per share, or a percentage of the par value. For example, if the par value is 100 and they will tell you it's 6%, 
six percent of a hundred is six dollars or they tell you it's one dollar per share or two dollar per share so you you know how much you would be receiving as a preferred shareholders there are many types of preferred shares as i told you it's a contract and there are many types but here we're gonna simplify it into non-cumulative and cumulative what's the difference between the two the non-cumulative preferred they have a fixed dividend amount as i told you these shares are usually entitled to a fixed amount for example five dollar per share or five dollar per year this is paid out before any dividend paid to the shareholder now if it's non-cumulative what does that mean it means if the dividend is not declared in a given year that's it you forego your right so if let's assume the company did not make a profit if we don't make a profit we're not going to pay dividend or the board of directors we made the profit but the board of directors thinks we should keep the money well if that's the case that five dollar for that particular year five dollar per share is gone you have no right to receive it if that if that for that particular year if the board of directors did not declare dividend versus a cumulative preferred if the dividend if the preferred stock is a cumulative preferred stock cumulative preferred shares with cumulative preferred if the company does not declare a dividend in a particular year let's assume this five dollars your rights will accumulate so let's assume you own one thousand shares well your right for every year is five thousand dollar because five thousand shares a uh, one thousand shares times five dollar per share let's assume year one let's assume year one the company did not make a profit or they did not declare dividend you didn't get anything in year two also they did not declare in year three they decided to pay dividend guess what if it's a cumulative they have to go back first pay you year one five thousand year two five thousand year three five thousand before they pay the common so cumulative kind of they're protecting your what's called dividend in area they're called dividend in area this accumulated dividend must be paid out to the cumulative preferred shareholders before any dividend paid to common shareholders so you want to have really preferred cumulative because you are protected you are protected stock dividend stock dividend is a different type of dividend stock dividend is when the company pay you reward you but they don't pay you cash remember when we said it's cash they don't pay you cash what they do is they give you additional shares of stocks how does it happen let's assume the company has in total 100,000 shares in total 100,000 you happen to own again I'm gonna say 10,000 so you are a 10% owner let's assume the company decided to distribute an additional uh, let's say 40,000 shares so this is new 40 so they have authorized shares and they take they want to take 40,000 of these shares and distribute them how much distribute them to existing shareholders how much will you get if you're an existing shareholders you're a 10% owner you'll get 4,000 new shares if you get 4,000 new shares 4,000 and you already have 10 in total you have 14,000 now the company have in total 140,000 the 100 the old ones plus the new ones so if we take 14 divided by 140 you're still 10 percent owner so the first thing you need to know that stock dividend your ownership will stay the same all what they're doing is they're giving you new share in proportion of your current ownership so stock dividend represent a unique method of dividend distribution by a corporation that's different from cash dividend now why would they give you stock dividend because they want to keep the cash that's that's the reason why they want to use the cash for something else so what are stock dividend they are issued from corporations own pool of authorized but unissued shares these shares these are shares that the company is legally allowed to issue but they have not distributed unlike cash dividend stock dividend do not involve the distribution of corporate assets simply put you don't reduce shareholders equity they involve issuing additional shares of retain of shareholders so you're saying if we're issuing shares how are we doing this without reducing without reducing equity here's what's going to happen what's going to happen is retained earnings goes down by the amount of dividend and common stock goes up both are equity so one equity account goes down retained earnings. because remember all dividend comes out of profit profit is in retained earnings so what you did is you issued shares against the earnings so the, the retained earnings went down common stock went up and no effect on the total equity of the company it's the same well how about tax implication well the shareholders receiving stock dividend do not owe immediate taxes on them because in contrast to cash dividend unless 
unless they are giving the option to receive either stock dividend or cash. If that's the option and you receive stock dividend, you still have to pay the cash. But generally speaking, they don't give you the option. So therefore, there are no tax consequences. Impact on the corporate solvency issuing stock dividend do not affect the solvency of the corporation. No actual assets are being distributed. So basically, before and after, the balance sheet stays the same. All what you're doing is reducing one equity, increasing the other equity, reducing retained earnings, increasing common stock and paid in capital. Effect on the creditors and shareholders, no adverse impact on the creditors and existing shareholders. As I showed you, your ownership is still 10% and creditors are not harmed because you're not paying cash. Creditors don't like when you pay cash. Therefore, they're okay with that. As a shareholders, you have the right to inspect the books and records of the company because you're the owner of the company. Now you have to know what are your rights. The rights of shareholders to inspect is an important aspect. Why? For corporate governance and transparency. You're the owner. You want to know what's going on. So if you want to inspect the books, give them a five-day, at least a five-day written notice. And you have to have a purpose. The notice must state, must, must. You have to state the proper purpose. This means the reason for inspecting the books should be related to your interest in the company. Maybe you, you are trying to find out if, if they're not doing the right thing. You want to, to sue someone because they're not properly sue someone inside the company because they're not properly running the company. You could also send someone, a representative on your behalf, like an attorney, an accountant, a consultant, an agent, to conduct the inspection on your behalf. Now, what's proper and what's not proper use? Because what we said is a proper use. Proper use would include initiate a derivative suit. What is that? We're going to talk about this in a moment. Simply put, you want to sue the company or sue someone either inside the company or outside the company because you believe the company is not doing a good job. It's your right as a shareholder to see if that's happening and take action to initiate a derivative suit or a lawsuit. To solicit other shareholders for, for votes on corporate matters such as electing directors. You can do that. This is a proper purpose. You want to get in touch with the other shareholders to kind of say, let's let's maybe let's have a meeting to maybe agree to, to all vote for a person. That's fine. What's improper uses? Obviously, you're going to know what improper uses. You're using this information for your own personal gain. Okay? Activities not related to the shareholders' interests, such as obtaining names for a retail mailing list can be grounds for denying such inspection. So you want to get the names, maybe market to them certain product, because you know shareholders, they have money. Maybe you want to market to them your product of another company. You can't do that. So the purpose is you are doing this for your shareholders, for your interest as a shareholder in the company. Preemptive rights. What are preemptive rights? If you have not watched the Facebook movie, Social Network, how Facebook started, you want to watch this movie because it's all about the preemptive rights. The preemptive rights allows current shareholders the opportunity to purchase additional shares before the corporation offers them to the general public. This right is crucial for shareholders to wishes to maintain proportional ownership and voting, voting strength in a corporation. Remember, we had 100,000 shares in total. You own 10,000, and we said because you own 10,000, you own 10% 10 of the company. Now, let's assume the company wants to issue new, go back to the 40,000 shares. First thing they have to do, if, if the preemptive right exists, they have to tell you, we offer you 4,000. Why 4,000? 4,000 out of, 4, of 40,000 represent 10%. First, they have to tell you, you have the right to get 10%. You have the right to buy 10% before anyone else. Why? Because if we're issuing 40,000 shares and we already have 100,000, the total number of shares will be 140,000. If you do buy the shares, you would have 14 now out of 140, and you keep your current ownership at 10%. Now, in the Facebook story, what, what happened is they issued new shares, and they did not give the co-owner of Facebook any preemptive right to get those shares. They were just issuing them to the current shareholders. Basically, they wipe this guy out, watch the movie, and Mark Zuckerberg was able to get a higher percentage of the company and a higher saying. And I believe, uh, I can't remember his name, his ownership went from like 18% down to less than 3% or even less than that by issuing no shares. Watch the movie, Social Network. It's how Facebook, you know, it's the how Facebook was created. It's a movie. Historically, under common law, shareholders were generally granted the preemptive right. This meant that right was automatically granted to them when new shares are issued. Under the new rule, under the Revised Model Business Corporation Act, preemptive rights are not automatically assumed. 
they must be in the articles of the incorporation so if, if they are you have the right if they are not they don't exist therefore you want to read the articles of incorporation before you invest in a company again the implication is the preemptive right protect the existing shareholder from dilution this is what happened to i don't remember his name without these rights issuing new shares could reduce their proportional ownership and voting power and this is what happened to him he was wiped out fernando i believe i don't remember Corporate flexibility. Not have an automatic preemptive right gives corporation more flexibility in issuing shares. They can decide whether or not to grant these shares based on their own governance policy and strategic needs. It gives you more flexibility. Now we need to know about something called derivative action. And remember what we said is you want to inspect the books because you want to start a lawsuit. And this is where derivative action comes into place. Derivative action are key aspect of corporate law. It empowers shareholders to act in the interest of the corporation when the corporation leadership fails to do so and this is why you want to inspect the books as a shareholder you think the company is not doing something they're supposed to do so it's a mechanism to ensure that the corporation interests are protected well if, if management is not protecting the corporate interests, the shareholders can step in and this is what gives them the derivative rights so when a corporation has a valid legal claim against someone that someone could be an individual or another entity but choose not to pursue this legal action shareholders can step in and do what start this lawsuit in such cases shareholders have the right to initiate a lawsuit on behalf of the corporation so these actions are brought against internal figures inside the company like directors or external parties so the lawsuit could be inside people inside the company because the shareholders thinks that there is a director or a top level manager or a ceo not doing their job as a shareholder i want to start a lawsuit against them we want to differentiate between derivatives versus direct action direct action is when a shareholder has a personal claim against the corporation now you are going directly against the corporation it's you against the corporation derivatives is you are starting a lawsuit on behalf of the corporation because the corporation leadership is not doing their job so personal versus corporate interest these cases involve issues where the shareholders individual rights are at stake so you're protecting your interests separate from the interest of the corporate corporation as a whole so the derivative action is you are trying to protect the corporation as a whole as a shareholder in a direct action you are protecting your interests so these legal provisions empower shareholders to take actions in defense of the corporation reinforcing the accountability of corporate management and directors so you can sue the company directly if you have any problem with the company itself or with its management or you can start a lawsuit on behalf of the company against internal as well as external parties know the difference between those two let's take a look at this multiple choice questions from farhatlectures.com what do preemptive rights enable shareholders to do when you think of preemptive rights i want you to think of the facebook movie social network okay so what's preemptive right preemptive right protect your interests your current interests when the company issue new shares of stock okay voting on executive salaries no no you don't vote on executive salaries usually the board of directors does this you don't you know preemptive right don't give you that right uh, receive yearly dividend remember you have no right to yearly dividend you have no right to any dividend the board of directors decide on that directly manage corporate operation you don't do that management does that so preemptive right maintain your proportional ownership when new shares are issued so if you're a 10 percent currently 10 percent owner and the company decided to issue 1 million new shares what they do of that 1 million they're going to ask you to if you want to buy 100,000 why 100,000 because 100,000 is 10 percent therefore if you buy them and they get added to the new shares you maintain your 10 percent ownership this is what preemptive right to protect your current interests what should you do now you want to go to farhat lectures look at additional mcqs resources whether you are a cpa exam candidate accounting student or studying some other professional certification invest in yourself stay motivated the cpa exam is worth it